thanks for uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Um, so uh, yeah, as as uh, Wes said, I've uh, been at Uber for a while, uh, working on working on self driving specifically. Uh, working on uh, the simulation team, like how we how we test and validate these things, and um, man, it is uh, it is such a cool job. I hope you all uh, I hope you all find this content as as interesting as I do. So let's get right into it. Um, a lot of people want to know why are we doing this? Like why are we bothering to make to make self driving cars? There are a couple of sort of fundamental reasons. Like one is. Uh, cars kill 1.3 million people a year, like every year, 1.3 million people die. Um, in the United States, the leading cause of death, if you are under 24, is motor vehicle crash. So any of you under 24, look out for those cars because that is probably the thing that will kill you. Um, this is not good, right? Like this is, like driving is very, very dangerous. And we can do something about that. And the, uh, the reason that like, Uber specifically uh, is interested in self-driving is we are a transportation company and transportation right now is not accessible to as many people as we would like it to be, transportation as a service. Uh, people have to own cars and in, in many parts of the, of the world, like car ownership is sort of the only way to get around. And that is something we would like to improve. And self-driving gives us a way to do that by driving down the costs of transportation as a service. And interestingly, like the, the best way to deploy these self-driving vehicles, um, like as they're under development, they're probably not gonna work everywhere. But until they work everywhere, they will work somewhere. And that somewhere is you know, serviced by a ride-sharing network that's the best way to sort of you know, add these vehicles, and, you know, put these vehicles into service. So if you had a self-driving car that could only go down a, you know, a, a small neighborhood, that is not a very useful transportation service. But if you get your app out and say, I want to go somewhere, and if it happens to be the place you want to go is serviced by uh, self-driving, then you can get self-driving. And as you know, if not, then a person will take you. And as the capabilities improve, then uh, more and more rides can be handled by self-driving. And interestingly, I was just telling Wes a second ago, I think this actually increases demand for people to be doing driving. Um, as transportation becomes, you know, costs come down, it becomes viable to uh, you know, compete with personal car ownership. Um, there's going to be more, more and more people uh, needed to uh, fill in the gaps while, while autonomy uh, progresses. So in order to accomplish this, this is a, this is a, pretty, uh, a pretty big mission uh, that what we're up to. Uh, we need four things. We need to make vehicles at scale. So uh, we're not, we don't have any, like we don't have a factory. That's not our factory. Um, so we're working with automakers that make cars and working with them to manufacture them such that uh, we can make them autonomous uh, cost effectively. And we're building the autonomy systems themselves. Uh, so this is the, you know, the hardware that you know, sort of integrates all the sensors as well as all the, all the software that goes on the vehicle. And another thing people don't always think about is uh, fleet operations. Like if you have, if you're not gonna own these cars, someone's going to operate them for you. That means somebody's got to recharge them, refuel them, you know, change the tires, all the normal stuff that you would do if you owned a car. Like now, somebody's got to do that, and uh, that's you know that's fleet operations. And of course, as I said, the the network, right? Like the making the ride sharing network accept you know some blended amount of uh, of self driving trips is is the, you know, the fourth necessary piece. So uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is a lot of work and uh, we are super committed to making this happen, uh, which is why we employ over 1400 people just working on self-driving cars. Uh, they are all over the US and a little bit into Canada. Um, so we, we do, um, you know, we do all of those things on the, on the previous slide in, in sort of all of these locations. It's, um, it is, a, it is a major, major program, and we are, we are super committed to getting this right. So let's take a look at this edge computing device of ours here. Uh, this is a Volvo XC90, and this is the, the latest model that we, we call Xenon. 
um, the, the model names, the code names are all noble gases. Um, so this one uh, is currently on the streets of Pittsburgh and just, uh, just started going out around in Dallas. And so this is a, this is a, a vehicle you know, that we, we get from Volvo and we, uh, they, they make it special so that it's easier uh, to integrate the, the things that, you know, to do all the integration that we need to do uh, for our self-driving. So we don't have to kind of rip it all apart and run wires all over the place. And, you know, they give us some, you know, better mounting locations. And so from the factory, it is, it is produced uh, to be a self-driving car. And so then we, oh, and also the, uh, the Volvo's um, automatic emergency braking system uh, so cru crucial sort of redundant piece of equipment. But the parts that we add are the sensors. So we take the bumpers off and add some radars all the way around. We have the sensor wing on the top that's got, uh, it's got cameras pointing in all directions. It's got 360 degree LIDAR. The LIDAR is the most sort of conspicuous thing that you see if you see one of these things driving around because it's the only thing that moves. So it's like spins around. Uh, the, the LiDAR is 64 lasers, so 64 beams that, that spin around um, and return a point cloud uh, very precisely of uh, how, you know, the distance and intensity from all those 64 beams sort of sweeping, sweeping the world. Uh, it's a really great sensor. Um, then more cameras. And we still got some other, you know, we had some GPS and, and some, some uh, data modems. Well, I'll talk about those in a minute. Um, and then in the back, hidden, uh, hidden under the, uh, you know, in the secret compartment that Volvo made for us, is uh, this custom compute stack. And it's a pretty powerful uh, piece of compute that um, it's kind of like a little data center. And that will, I will get into that. Uh, oh, and the, the controls interface, the gateway module. It's like how we, how we actually interface with the, with the vehicle systems. So let's talk about like what, you know, the, the, the pieces of this, the pieces of the system and like sort of what, what they do with each other and how they make this whole thing work. So we've got a bunch of sensors. We, we talked about most of them. I mentioned them already. Uh, there's a couple others. There's ultrasonic, uh, IMU, you know, sort of the, the, the inertial, uh, just the accelerometers and, and like uh, wheel encoders, you know, some other, some other sensors that we can get that just come with the vehicle um, that, that we pull in. And we take all that input and we feed it into a whole bunch of software. And that software, uh, you know, these are, these are sort of the major components uh, of, you know, that we do in there. And those, those like learn how to drive the car. You know, they, 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 they understand the world, they decide what to do about it, and they decide where things are gonna be and what to do about it. And then they make a path uh, through the world. And those, uh, those commands are executed by the control systems. Behind the scenes or sort of underneath it all, is a really remarkable amount of computing power that, that sort of runs all that software. So when we make, we take all these, you know, as we take all these sensors and, and we, we stick them on this vehicle, um, these are very precise instruments and they need to be calibrated to produce uh, useful results. So as every vehicle is, is integrated, we put it through this calibration phase, which is pretty cool looking, uh, where we spin it around on a turntable, and then there are all these targets that are set up, and those uh, those measure the the lidar and the camera uh, performance. And with with that information, then you know we we can figure out the physical properties of where the sensors are, like tiny little variations in in sort of how they how they were installed, um, any manufacturing uh, differences in the different sensors. Um, as well as the little bits of lidar that sort of hit the vehicle itself as it as it spins around, you know, you'll you'll note the vehicle is not round, and so as you, the the lidar spins around, some parts of it uh, the w are blocked by uh, by the laser light, and so we we mask those out so that we don't um, we don't you know doesn't we don't have to worry about those those returns. And those, the exact physical shape of all of, you know, how those returns come back is a little bit different on every vehicle. So we, we calibrate them all. And so inside the vehicle, we have some computers, uh, about five of them uh, at the moment. And these are x86 machines like that you might, 
you know, the, the, the kind that you're familiar with. And the, uh, they've also got some GPUs and there are a couple FPGAs in there. They talk to each other over a local network. So they're, this is a distributed system uh, that runs on a car. So they, uh, the, the, the nodes, you know, different parts of the autonomy software stack are distributed across these, these different nodes. And they do their, you know, they, they coordinate uh, to, to sort of do their work. There are some physical connections with, um, with the sensors, you know, so like the, the LiDAR sensor has like a special connector that comes off of the, you know, the unit that's got to go somewhere. And so that physical connector goes into uh, one of the nodes, uh, likewise with the cameras um, and, and sort of all the other sensors. They're, they're connected to individual nodes and the information gets sort of redistributed uh, across that network as well as the controls. So the, you know, the, the interface to the control system is a, is a physical interface that's gotta be connected to some, to some node. So, uh, so, so far, um, all of this is, uh, these, are, these are nodes talking to each other, uh, coordinating to, uh, around a single task of, of driving a car. Uh, we also need to take in information from the outside world about uh, where people wanna go. So we have a telematics module uh, and a couple of LTE modems with carrier diversity that will uh, that we can take trip requests and send back kind of you know telemetry and, and operational data. And so uh, so behold, we uh, we have an, we have an edge computing device. Uh, this uh, the system has to make all of its decisions locally. So it can't it can't re rely on any any systems off board to make any kind of decisions about how to drive the car. So it's got to use the sensors, the, all of the software that needs to make that decision has to be on board. Um, all of the, all, all we get from the outside world, you know, the outside world of data is where people want to be picked up. So uh, we have a lot of data that we stick on board inside of these nodes uh, to make all this work. And so if you look, if you look inside of one of these nodes, you will see we've got a, we've got a read-only section uh, where we keep the operating system, which is a Yocto-derived Linux uh, distribution that does a secure boot with a signed kernel, signed OS image. Um, the actual code binaries are the, the executables that, that run the autonomy software. Uh, those, are, those are signed um, by the you know, sort of build and release process. And uh, the, you know, a bunch of what happens, a bunch of the way these algorithms work is there are learned models that, that we need access to, to, you know, sort of, to sort of make predictions uh, about the world. And all of those models have to be sort of packaged up uh, and distributed on the, on the vehicle in the, in the read-only area. We also need HD maps. Uh, HD maps are high resolution. They're, they're like regular maps except um, way more information, so so lots of you know de detailed detailed data down to uh, sort of centimeter resolution of where the you know, how the road works and connects to other things. So all those things uh, are are the sort of the the things that that's how we make all these decisions locally. Is we we take the sensor input and it goes through all of this stuff. There is also a writable area for, for logs, and so we, uh, we log all of the sensor data. So as the, as the sensors are running, they are producing a tremendous amount of data, and it all gets saved, as well as uh, various diagnostics from the software itself and a bunch of stuff that, uh, that we get from, from the vehicle itself. So whenever the vehicles are on, they are logging what, uh, whatever is happening. So as you can imagine, that is a tremendous amount of data. So we do not, uh, we do not attempt to offload this data over the LTE. What we do is we take the vehicles into uh, the depot and, when, and we dock them with a, uh, with a very uh, high throughput connector and we offload directly from the vehicle through a private network into the a data center. Uh, we take all the data off that was deemed to be uh, interesting by whoever was operating the vehicle. So whatever they 
took the vehicle out to go do that vehicle's mission. Uh, there's some way of, of, you know, sort of ascribing the, the, the intent for this, um, you know, for this log. We, we offload that and based on, um, based on why, we, why we drove the car, we might do one of, uh, one of a few different things. Um, and I will explain them to you now. So the first is analytics, which is uh, where we try to just figure out sort of what happened in aggregate. So this is usually something we do off, off you know, uh, a lot of driving in a, in, a, in a small area where we're trying to learn something about like how often something happens or how well we do on a certain thing or, or just try, trying to understand like what are, the, what are the performance characteristics of the software in, um, in, a, certain, in a certain area or under certain conditions. And so this is another, an, another cool visualization, but it just sort of shows like if we need a certain capability, like how often uh, do we need that capability and sort of like where geographically is it, how long would we need it for? Um, so there's lots of cool stuff we can do there. This is a, a, a latency graph of showing uh, as we're driving around this, this little loop by our office, uh, the end-to-end -end system latency uh, were sort of plotted out. So we, we drove it a whole bunch and then you can sort of see like where, where it uh, start, you know, things are fast and things are slow and can sort of break it down by the, by the subsystems. And my, my current favorite project is uh, making scenarios out of uh, like sort of detecting little sort of re repeatable uh, sections of uh, driving behavior based on, uh, based on taking logs. So the other big thing that we do is we make these HD maps. So, uh, this is a this is a uh, a very labor intensive and compute intensive process, and uh, but it's it it starts from a log. So we to to get these maps, we have humans drive around while the software is running, and so they're they're logging all the sensor data. Uh, we record all the sensor data, and uh, you know with with sort of mul multiple laps of of the same area, and then we try to find uh, all the movers and the background. Got to find, once we find those, we sort of subtract those out, and then we, from, from basically a bunch of LiDAR points, uh, we have very detailed ground imagery of, of an area where we'd like to drive. And we merge it all together. Uh, we have what are, what are called priors that we can use uh, to localize. So uh, the way the vehicle figures out where it is is the LiDAR spins around, and we look at this map and we figure out, based on the point cloud that's coming back, where must we be on this map? Uh, and this works really, really well, or really uh, sort of precisely. Uh, it's, it's a very accurate way of, of uh, sort of figuring out where you are uh, compared to GPS. So we don't, we don't use GPS to, to localize the vehicle. Uh, it's, done with, it's done with LiDAR. Uh, but of course, also in the, in the AV map, we have uh, all sorts of things about lane connectivity and you know, what, what the traffic signals mean, and, um, all, all this different kind of stuff. So the, uh, the HD map is, is part of, you know, we, we use logs to, uh, to produce it, but we then take that artifact back and put it on the vehicle, uh, sort of like a, like a cache. So we, instead of having uh, onboard to try to figure out, um, oh, these buildings are all in the background, every single, uh, you know, every single cycle of the LiDAR, we have a cache that says those. That is definitely a building that's in the background. Uh, you don't. You don't need to worry about it. So the the biggest thing that we do with logs, though, is we try to figure out how well the software works. Uh, performance evaluation. Um, like we we drove. We had the car driving in autonomy, and like what happened? Like did it did it do what we wanted it to do? So if you will recall this picture, um, you see that center, uh, the, the center block there, that's kind of the main thing that we, you know, that's the, that's the main thing that determines the, the you know, the vehicle's behavior. Um, we, it's, it's the kind, you know, it's, it's where there's a lot of, you know, a lot of engineering effort and a lot of complexity. And uh, this is of course, a, so this is the part that, you know, that we need to test and evaluate when we're driving. Um, but this is uh, unfortunately a very simplified version because the real version of the software looks like that. Um, I think it, 
that's like even sort of a simplified version. Uh, there's even a crazier version that's just like, you know, with all the dependencies mapped out, uh, that's, that's really interesting to look at. But so, so you know, this is, this is a lot of software. There's a lot of software and, and we need to figure out like whether it's doing the right thing. And this is the challenge. I think this is, this is, um, this is a really interesting problem. So, so how, how do you test that much software? And obviously there are some basic, just sort of, you know, you know, table stakes, like of course, you're gonna have unit tests, like obviously, um, you know, we, so we build with, uh, with a very recent version of Clang, and so we have uh, a, uh, access to all these like awesome sanitizers for addresses and memory and, and threads and uh, undefined behavior uh, is what those stand for. Um, oh yeah, the, the software, the autonomy software is all uh, C++. So the, the binaries that go on, on all of the, on all of the, um, the compute nodes, those are all uh, C++ sort of compiled uh, executables. And you know, so we can do a little bit better than, it, than, than simple unit tests. You know, we can sort of stitch together some of those you know, chunks of that graph uh, that, we, that we showed a second ago. And you know, that's, that, that can help, you know, like can you load a map? Can you, you know, can, does this subsystem sort of start up? Uh, and that's, that's good. But there is a really interesting problem here, which is the, what the software does uh, is it changes, like depending on what the software does, uh, it changes the inputs to the next cycle around. So there is a feedback cycle there. If you uh, change the software in the middle, it will tell the controls to do a different thing, which will change what the sensors read. And so it's very hard to have these sort of isolated tests, like the, a, a change in one of these, a change in one subsystem uh, necessitates like testing it end to end to make sure those different inputs to your upstream system uh, are still are still going to work. So the only real way to test this kind of stuff at some level is to drive it. So to do that, we built a track. This is a track near near our office in Pittsburgh. Uh, it's 40 acres on an old steel mill site. Uh, we have 15 kilometers of roads. Uh, we've got stop signs and traffic signals, and um, what else do we have? Oh, we have uh, we have like city buses, we have school buses, we have police cars, we have pedestrian crossings and bicycle lanes, um, shipping containers, and uh, stuff that we can you know make walls and things out of. Um, we uh, we put, we made a map out of it all, and all the streets are named after uh, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood uh, characters because they're in Pittsburgh. Uh, so it's very cool to see, you know, like Make Believe Lane and Trolley Drive and all that. Um, but anyway, so so we have this track, and and you can you can do like real end-to-end -end testing on it. Um, we we have a team of test engineers that go out to this track and they set up scenarios and they use. Uh, they use robotic stand-ins for for uh, pedestrians, cyclists, that sort of thing, uh, or or you know real cars with people in them, or they have foam cars. Uh, so there's there's all of these tools that we can use to sort of recreate uh, different scenarios that we want to test at the track. And this is the the crucial um, sort of the the crucial concept here is scenario-based testing. We don't, um, we don't put the cars on the track and say, drive around and just see if it seems good, right? Like that would be, that would be very inefficient. So we have a set of scenarios uh, that we have to pass called the track verification test. And these scenarios are all formally specified. Like there's a team of people, they make maps like that one that say like you come in here and this is the you know, approach speed and this is the speed of the, of the roamer and the distance that you know, will be triggered at. And they recreate the, as close as they can the same scenario every single time. And so that's, that's how we test the track. Um, the problem, as you can probably see coming here, is uh, that is going to take a lot of time. So that only happens at real time. And so the number of scenarios you can evaluate uh, is based on how many uh, like cars you have and how many of them you can fit into a space. And 40 acres is a lot, but it's not that much. So. 
um, the the way you know the the throughput that we can get out of out of track testing is nowhere near uh, where we want it to be. Uh, and so, like importantly, imagine if you're a developer and you're working on some you're working on some change, and you say, okay, cool, I think this is a good this is a good change. Like, sound, sounds good. Can we test it at the track? Like, imagine you you do your work and you know you run your unit tests. Good job. And um, you're like, sweet, when can I get on the track? And it turns out it will take you know, three days to get your answer back. Like that is a, that is a pretty uh, unacceptably long turnaround cycle uh, to, to sort of get, get a new answer. So uh, you know, that feedback cycle is, is no good. And so what we really want to do is be able to run the software on something that isn't a car. Like, that isn't a car and it isn't at a track that will give us much, much more throughput. And for that, we turn to simulation. So simulation is where we run that software somewhere else. And one way that we could do this uh, is what's called hardware in the loop simulation, where you take some sensor data and you connect it up to the actual vehicle hardware, either like maybe you put one of the, you know, you built a little, a compute, no, you know, compute module on a bench, or maybe you built a few of them and stuck them in the data center, or maybe you can plug them into a car at night when the cars are docked uh, and use an actual car uh, plugged in, you know, and just um, send, send it sensor data. Um, all of those are good options, but again, they are still very expensive and limited by how many of those vehicle hardware stacks uh, you want to build. They also have an interesting property, which is while they run real time, uh, you know, so you, you, you feed sensor data in as fast as you would if it was, if the software was really running, uh, there's no guarantee that for the same set of inputs that you will get exactly the same set of outputs. So there are, remember, there are five machines that are doing this work here. This is a distributed system. Furthermore, there are GPUs involved. And there are sometimes the subtle timing differences slightly change the output. So if you're working on a problem and you say, great, I'm going to run this on the, on the hill bench, uh, you might not get exactly the same answer every time, which is uh, a little frustrating. So what we use the hill bench for is to understand the performance and sort of integration issues. So like, the understanding the actual performance of the software when it runs on realistic hardware in a sort of realistic timing environment, uh, we can we can get that from from Hill, and we can um, you know extract a bunch of analytics about uh, how how well things are running in a in a way that we we wouldn't do on a on an actual car. So so that's pretty good, um, but it still doesn't fix the um, it still doesn't fix the throughput problem. So for that, we turn to the SIL testing software in the loop, where we take our sensor data and we run it not on a vehicle, on normal computers that people have, uh, or that you can get from cloud providers, or that you might put in your data center. Um, now what that means is we don't have this like really awesome sort of timing accurate uh, performance accurate set of hardware to, to run the software on. We maybe don't have the same number of GPUs or the same kind of GPUs. Um, we, the, there's, there's sort of no way to get the, the exact vehicle performance out of, uh, out of this commodity hardware. So what we do is we run the software in what we call single task determinism mode where we fix the other problem with hill testing, which is we make the results perfectly repeatable. So if you run uh, with the same set of inputs twice, you will get exactly the same results. So we, we step the, you know, the autonomy, there's, a, there's an executive that sort of controls all the autonomy tasks and like allows the messages to pass orderly uh, or you know, in, in, in its prescribed order uh, through, through the graph and that's slower that is much slower than if you were running it on the real hardware, but it gives you the same results every time. Importantly, also, because uh, there runs on commodity hardware, we can run this on thousands of machines. 
and then just give them back to the cloud provider when we're done. So this is, um, the, this is sort of the, the bulk of the kind of energy that goes into measuring autonomy performance uh, is, at least for us, is, is with uh, software and the loop testing. And so the, uh, the main, there, there are two kinds of, of software and loop testing that, that we use. One is log-based simulation where, so we have our, you know, this is our sort of software stack running in single task determinism and we replay a log, like we read the sensors back from a log and uh, when, and we have a, a, a simulator for uh, how to execute those controls. So there's a you know, vehicle dynamics model, and it uh, says, oh, based on these you know, controls inputs, like I'm gonna move you through the world or whatever. And then we take that, uh, we take the output and, or of, of you know, where the vehicle is, and we run it all the way back to the beginning and send, send, more, send more sensor data through the thing. So before we, before we get into even, even more like, interesting, tricky problems, um, quick glossary in case you are not working on robotics. Um, there are a few terms that I, I just want to use because it's, uh, much more, it's much easier to talk about and also it's baked into some of these images. Um, pose is the position and orientation of an object. It just means like where it is and where it's, where it's facing. Occlusion is like blockage or obstruction. So like if your sensor can't see something because there's something else in front of it. And jerk is the rate of change of acceleration. Um, so that's not, no, not relevant to simulation actually. It's more of just when you see these words now, now you know what they mean. So vehicle pose, like what the, the vehicle model spits out is, okay, well now the AV is here in this position and it's facing this way. So what you might wonder, and this is what I wondered when I first started working on this problem, is how is this at all possible to replay sensor data through a new version of the software and do anything realistic? Because as soon as you do something slightly different, then the whole log becomes invalid, right? Well, you'd sort of think that, and you're kind of right, uh, because the log itself is definitely static. Um, and the log-based simulator is mostly an open loop simulation because we can't change the sensor data, it's pre-recorded. But there is an interesting thing that we can do uh, to get us a feedback cycle that's, that's useful for testing, which is the output of perception uh, uses uh, coordinates in the map. So if it, no, no matter where the vehicle is, it will still says the, the objects we perceive are at these locations. So if we, um, so, so if the autonomy software decides to do something different in, in the log replay simulation, uh, the objects still appear to show up at the, at the right places. So here's an example of, of a log sim. So there's an original log um, of sort of making a left turn there, and the ghost vehicle is the logged actor, or the, the logged AV, and the, the solid vehicle is the simulated one. And so when the, uh, when the logged vehicle uh, diverges from the, the simulated vehicle, we're effectively running a perception from the perspective of the logged vehicle. But as long as they're, they're not too far away, this ends up producing uh, use, useful results. Another big problem, of course, is all the actors that are in the log, they are they're gonna do whatever it is that they did. So if the simulator decides to do something different, um, it's too bad, um, they're just gonna like run right through you. So if we slightly change the timing of this interaction, uh, we see that the, the logged AV goes way off there and then people are just plowing through us, you know, in like phantom car mode. Um, you also see the interesting artifact of when the, when the logged AV gets way far away, the vehicles uh, start to flicker right where the, the simulated AV is because the perception is actually running like way down the road and it starts to lose sight of those, uh, those vehicles behind it. So uh, clearly uh, you don't, this, you know, there's, there's a limit to how far you can push this, but for a small amount of divergence, this ends up working pretty well. You still get sort of predictive results. But when, uh, when you want to take a log and play it back through, uh, through a simulator, you can't just like drop the autonomy software like right in the middle of some place because the algorithms all build up state and you have to seed that state 
So what we do is we have a thing called pre-roll where we drag the AV along, uh, whether it likes it or not. And we just, we, we just force it with the, uh, with the logged pose. And we say, I don't care what you think you're trying to do, but where you are now is here. And we let it, you know, pretend that it's controlling something, but it just gets dragged along. And then at the moment where we want to test something, then we flip it to the normal mode after all the algorithms have their, their state all sort of, you know, reaccumulated. Um, then, we, then we let it drive. And so, I, you know, also you can see we, we can't do log sim for very long because the chance of divergence is just too high. So usually we run, you know, five, 10 second snippets, just, just some interaction and just to make sure that, that, uh, that we do the right thing in that interaction. Well, so the other kind of simulation uh, that we do is we call virtual simulation. Some people call it uh, different names, but uh, this, is, this is where we take a sim engine. We use a, we use a game engine, we use an Unreal Engine, and uh, we have a virtual world, and we feed, the, uh, we, we feed it detected objects. So we skip a little bit of perception, uh, but then we run the rest of the stack. And interestingly, this allows us to uh, have a, clo a full closed loop. So we don't have to have all those weird divergence artifacts and, and, you know, and, you know, actors, uh, we can have, we can make traffic, you know, we can make our own traffic. Like this is a, just some map that somebody made and they just threw a bunch of actors down and, and, you know, that they, they queue behind each other and, you know, the, none of, none of these are real cars. This is all uh, a scene that somebody just set up. And so the other thing that we can do in virtual sim is we can vary. We can vary the parameters of a certain interaction. Um, so instead of running one single log example, we can run thousands of subtle permutations. You know, we can, we can vary if there's, if there's a trigger that sends an actor along uh, away, we can vary the, the, the distance from the, from the vehicle for the trigger, the speed of the, of the actor, and it can actually be a multi-dimensional uh, variable space. So you're probably wondering, wow, that's cool, but how will you ever understand the output of, let's just say, 10,000 things? Well, it turns out it's really hard to understand the output of 10,000 things. And so we built, uh, we built some tools that, that help you do that. And so in this, uh, this is a tool we made called Variations Explorer, where it allows engineers to sort of poke around on the result set and say, um, you know, un understand, like, based on the, the different, um, you know, the, the things that were being varied, like how did, the, how did the software perform? And sometimes, you know, so like the, the yellow and purple ones are, are pass-fail, so that's like a problem, like somebody is exploring. Uh, but the other one, the green one, is uh, some other metric about like how the software behaved under, under those circumstances. And so, so this, this is a super powerful tool uh, to really understand um, like more thoroughly uh, a given scenario, like, like how well we do. And here is an example uh, that we did of finding a problem before it ever made it to the car. So this is, a, this is an intersection in Pittsburgh where we want to drive. And notably, there is a stop sign that you see, but there's no stop sign the other way. So this is what we call an unprotected right. So we want to make a right turn there. So we made this, we put this in simulation. And if you were to just sort of pick some values for like, how to, how to add cross traffic to this situation, uh, you might sort of naively come up with, I don't know, something like this. Um, is it going? Oh, yeah. Uh, where, you know, you cautiously wait, and then, you know, there's some cross traffic, and uh, there it is. Yeah, so good job. We did the right thing. But uh, as you know, like, there are so many other possible ways that, uh, that a sort of yield operation like that could go. And so what we did is we made a parameter sweep where we ran this thousands of times where we varied the speed of the cross traffic and uh, the distance for when, when they start moving. And we found something really surprising, which is the red box there, where it turns out due to bugs that are complicated and I'm not gonna go into, um, under certain very specific conditions, uh, we actually do the wrong thing. But you can do that in simulation all day long, right? Like, that's, <laughs> that's why we have it. Uh, so that's a, you know, you would never be able to, to know whether the software was going to do the right thing uh, by, by just driving it on the track or even, even driving it on the road because we just, in one go, we ran it a thousand times. 
So uh, we used 1,000 computers, and then we turned them off when we were done. Here's another example of a problem that we work on in simulation. This is a really, a really important one. Uh, and this is where occlusion comes in. So notice how the bus is blocking the view of, of the child who's, who's running across. And you just can't, you can't see her coming. And the light is green, so we're proceeding <laughs> ahead, but she's running. That's no good. Uh, that's a problem we have to make sure that we handle. So what we do is we recreate this at the track with a little <laughs> robot dude. But I don't know if you notice, like when, you, when you're sitting in the driver's seat, you just can't see. If you just barely look through the bus, you can sort of see it coming, but uh, it's, it's really, really tricky. So this is occlusion, and occlusion uh, is, a, is a really tricky problem. So what we do, that's the laser trigger and the, the test ops team, and they're setting up their little robot roamer guy, and it's like, ugh, tough, right? So uh, we take this and we built we built it in the simulator. So we built, um, this is like the, the Unreal-based editor, and so like, we go add a tra path of travel for the AV, we put a bus in there, and set up a trigger. Anyway, you get the idea. We run it, and then we'll make sure that it's sort of having the interaction that we like, and then we test it at the track and make, make, sure, make sure that we got it right. And that's, so that's like the, that is the, the power of simulation. A tricky problem though is how do you know whether you actually are doing the right thing? Like how do you know whether a given situation like it should, it is correct or incorrect? Uh, it's, once you add variations to your world, it is, um, it is really problematic. So, um, cause you can explore, you can test things all the way to failure. And so anyway, so we built a system uh, called SR, which is our, our sort of framework for, for deciding uh, whether something should pass or something should fail. And uh, it sort of adapts to situations that it sees and, and it has a, a correct response with sort of the, the driving requirements associated with that response. And uh, yeah, so here's an example of um, where there are two cases that are, they look very similar. And in one case, the correct thing on the left, the correct thing to do is slam on the brakes. And then on the right, the correct thing to do is gently put on the brakes. Like they're both, you know, yield, yield to, to pedestrians, but one, they're, you want hard, you need hard braking, but the other one, if you slam on the brakes on the right, uh, that would be very surprising, uh, very, very uncomfortable, and people behind you, uh, you'd, you'd be at risk of, of, of them running into you, right? So, so very similar situation, but two sort of different uh, appropriate responses. So how do we know that any of this actually matches the real world? Tricky problem, uh, because as I said, sim is, uh, we, the software in the loop testing we run is deterministic. So that, that uh, the sort of red line there, like every single time you run, uh, you run a simulation, you get the same answer. This is us trying to do the same thing uh, 30 times uh, on the track. And you know, it's like a little bit different. Uh, here's uh, sort of another view of that same data. This is, this is uh, the path time divergence of uh, at the track doing the same thing 30 times. And so, you know, it's pretty close uh, when you do it at the track, but even at the track, you can't quite get it. Uh, but we have found problems with this. Um, this is one test we did where for some reason, the SDV was doing a very, very different thing. And we looked into it and we were like, whoa, that's pretty different. And it turns out that what happened was we weren't modeling occlusion correctly and we were uh, letting it see a, a, a traffic signal that it shouldn't have been able to see. And so it was cheating and it was slamming on the brakes like way too soon and defeating the whole purpose of the test. Uh, so we fixed the bug with the occlusion modeling and now it's, uh, the results are, are sort of where, where you'd expect them to be. So. Uh, as I said before, like we, we run all this stuff, uh, we run all this stuff in the cloud. It's an ideal workload uh, for running in the public cloud. This is not very edge, but still, I think, kind of interesting. Uh, because as a developer, you can spin up uh, a giant fleet of virtual vehicles and then shut them down after you have tested your tested your software. Uh, so yeah, the you know, it's it's only when when you want to test something and. Um, then you, you don't you know, need to leave it running for, for a long time. 
So some of these experiments, uh, you know, I, I said thousands, but, but there are some, some actual workflows that use 100,000. So we need to run 100,000 simulations and figure something out. Uh, somebody is asking now for a million, um, which we don't yet do, like one test for a million, but uh, we'll, we'll get there. Um, you know, this is, you can just see like on the weekends, we don't, we don't have that many computers, but <laughs> during, uh, once people come in on Monday, all of a sudden we need, uh, we need a lot of computers. So if you imagine like the developer workflow now, now that we have simulation, like you can sort of imagine like, oh, you run your unit tests, like you run, you know, you run your simulation suite, and then, yeah, okay, yeah, you'll definitely test on the track, but like your changes get aggregated with a bunch of other people's changes. Um, and you know, of course, if there's a regression on the track, like you'll have to bisect it and figure it out, but this is, this is still like a much, much tighter workflow in that uh, for the most part, you can stay on the left-hand side um, and then the, the release testing, uh, you need to wait for the track. What we found uh, is running these gigantic simulations, um, not as easy as you might think, even though it's ideal for the public cloud. Um, most, uh, most batch APIs do not want to run a million things. Um, most, uh, they, they just, they sort of laugh at you about that. So we had to build a layer on top, uh, which for every evaluation that we run, uh, we have this tracker process that has like a queue, and then it, spun, it spins up a bunch of workers, and then the workers kind of ask for, you know, what thing do I do next? And that might actually be spread across multiple, like in this case, it's AWS batch. Like we might spawn 10 batch jobs uh, to, get a, to get enough workers, and those will all come in and fetch work, and then that's sort of resilient to spot reclaims and you know, various, other, various other cloud challenges. Another interesting problem we have is the, remember all that software and all the artifacts that go onto the, onto the compute nodes? That is a lot of data, and um, that ends up being a performance challenge uh, when trying to, when you try to run you know a thousand things, if you say hey take this thousand you know run this Docker container a thousand times, if the container is eight gigabytes, uh, this is this is not great. So uh, so imagine so like this is the onboard software. We build a container kind of like that, like ru like roughly like that, and so uh, that's you know eight gigs. And so what happens when these things start up is the you know you pull a layer and then. After you're done with that, then you have to extract the layer. And so that's like you've just written that eight gigabytes twice somewhere. And in our experience, the only somewhere that's in any way fast enough um, is our friend TempFS, also known as memory. Um, all of the storage, the storage options we could get um, were, were, were not good in, in various ways. Uh, so we amortize this cost by running the absolute largest machines uh, that Amazon will rent us. Um, so that you only, at least you only have to do it once um, for in, in most cases. So another big problem is on the vehicle, we use GPUs. And if we needed to get that many GPUs in, uh, in the cloud, this would be, uh, this, this would be very expensive. Um, they, they might not even uh, be able to fulfill a request fast enough. So, so like the inside of each one of those steps, there are, there are various, you know, learned models or sometimes, you know, actual GPU code. Um, those things, when they run on the car, they use a GPU to do, to do the inference. So when we run them in, when we run them offline, we call anything that's not the car offline. Um, so when they run offline, uh, those, those expensive algorithms have to run somewhere, but the thing is that they don't always change their outputs. So if you are, for example, working on motion planning, um, you, on, on the same scenario, all of the inputs are likely to be the same between your diffs, and so what we do is we cache the output of all of these, uh, all of these expensive GPU calls. Uh, most most of the simulations that we run are you know some amount cache hit, you know over 50% cache hit. So uh, we don't have to have all of those GPUs available uh, to do this inference, or you know use the expensive uh, CPU version. And uh, because we had a single task determinism, it would be very hard to keep those GPUs busy. Because remember, we're running much less than real time because it's single task. So we built a, uh, a remote GPU service so that we can we can spin up the model or the or the you know host the, the GPU code on a shared or a pool of shared GPU instances, and then uh, keep the utilization really high. Anyway, finally, like this is 
obviously uh, potentially very, very expensive if you allow developers to just say, hey, I want to do a million things. Like anytime like you let people do a million things, uh, this, this can be challenging uh, cost-wise. I'm, I'm sure Amazon is very happy to run our, to run our million uh, simulations, but um, this is, you know, m managing that has, uh, has definitely been a challenge. But anyway, this um, this you know the, this final the, the the final workflow that, that we can achieve here, which I what I think is really interesting, is once we have we put it all together, like we test with our simulation suite, uh, you test a release on the track. It, you know there's there's sort of an iteration cycle. If that doesn't pass, we go back, we work on it some more. If that does pass, we deploy to a small number of vehicles, assuming you know that might that might turn around and come back. And if that passes, we go to the full fleet. Somewhere after after driving for a while, we extract something. You know, something interesting happens um, all, out of all those logs. I mean, we offload all those logs, find interesting things, and it starts over again. And that's all I have. Thanks a lot.